Booker Tov, Shalom everyone. Rabbi Eric Solomon, Raleigh, North Carolina, Monday, May 11th. We're talking about Parshat Bahar. This week actually double Bahar and Bukhukotai. But I want to talk about Bahar, which means on the mountain, on Mount Sinai. And it discusses some of the key economic policies in ancient Israel of the Shemitah and the Yovel. Shemitah is called Shvi'it and the Yovel, the Jubilee year. What is it? The setup basically was there were seven year cycles on a 50 year cycle. And every seven years in the 50 year cycle, uh, that seventh year of the land had to be laid fallow. So if you were a farmer, you had it, you would cultivate it for six years. And the seventh, you would let it rest and you couldn't cultivate it. You could benefit from the natural grown food that came through it. And so could others, but you could no longer kind of control it and cultivate it specifically for you and your family and your like household. And that would happen every seven years until the 50th year when it was a jubilee year. It's also dealt with slaves, those who were your slaves uh, that you held, those who were your, you know, in any way, your possession. You had to let them go uh, after seven years, and especially after the 50 and the jubilee year as well. It was kind of returning of, uh, of people to their original households. And uh, the other seven years piece, which I want to focus on here, was the releasing of debts. So every seven years, there's a releasing of debts. So if you had a debt, you had borrowed within ancient Israel, and according to Torah, there was, you did not, within the Jewish community, the Israelite community, there was no interest bearing like loans. Um, but even though you have a loan that someone would give you after seven years, it would go back to normal. Now, there's a lot more discussion here, economic discussion. Uh, there's something called the Pros Bowl, which was a innovation by Hillel back then, because one of the questions immediately arose, is that lenders, those who had more money, were not willing to lend to someone who needed money in the latter years of the seven-year cycle as a problem was arising. Because they'd say, well, if I lend this money to you, I'm only going to give you a year or two to finish it up. I'm going to lose all this money, so I'm just going to stop lending, which caused a problem in society. And Hillel made an innovation called Pros Bowl. said, well, take your personal loan debt, and, it, and we're going to make a contract here that it actually becomes the debt of the court, like of the state, in a sense, like the Jewish communities. And it's no longer private loaning. Uh, it gets canceled in the seventh year, not quote unquote public loaning. And it was a way to circle it around to let the loans continue on. So it goes to show that the system, maybe its intent was to try to cancel debts and, and do, make it kind of equality every seven years. In practice, it was more complicated because, you know, the economics of it, uh, you know, it caused complexities, you know, which is even to this day. But what I want to just say, if you look at it at 30,000 feet, at 30,000 feet, the point of Bahar, the Shemitah, Shvi'it, and Yovel, the idea is that there will be classes within society. There'll be those with more resources, wealth, land, etc., and be those with less. That, that, that is going to be the case in ancient Israel and perhaps, you know, forever. There is that kind of div division. And the, it is, it's okay to exist, but there must be ways for that lower class, working class, underclass to be free. There must be an avenue for that specific class to get out of those debts. It cannot be that that specific class is continuously the same class. Now, maybe that there are new generations who arise and come and fill out those roles for some period of time, but there must be a way for advancement. If we burden this person and his or her family with these debts, with being enslaved forever, going in generations, then we will have constantly the same people, the same families, the same hereditary, whatever, in that position. And the Torah is making a statement, big adol, that is wrong. We can understand, imagine why. There will be those that need to serve those roles, but that is in perpetuity, it's not a jail sentence. It's a temporary period on the road, we hope, to flourishing success and to freedom. To be enslaved or to be an indentured servant may be a temporary, again, not that I'm wanting those things to be the case today, but back in ancient Israel, maybe a period of time, but it, it cannot be forever. God doesn't want to see a society where it's like that forever. Now, follow me here. I seen this specifically, and I learned this in my own way, 
when I went to buy my first house and I learned, this I did this 15 years ago coming to Raleigh, about mortgages. <laughs> so follow me here. When I went to the first house, I was so nervous. We moved to Raleigh and we were, we had a certain life savings, et cetera, to buy a home, you know, after a wedding from both Jenny and our upbringing. So we went to go buy a home. I learned about mortgages. I was freaked out. You know, what kind of horse can we afford? What can we do? And I'll never forget sitting down with the first mortgage broker and attorneys were sitting there to help explain to us, you know, uh, the way we could decide how much, because the numbers were, I'd never seen, I, I was, it was hard for me to focus. And he said, a mortgage is not <laughs> primarily, um, you know, a loan and a, and a money maker for, you know, the bank, although it is true. Primarily, a mortgage is a money saver it's a savings tool for the individual family, the household. What? Doesn't look like that. I'm paying money out every month. Bank seems to be making money on interest on what they loan me. You know, everybody seems to be, and I'm scared. I said, well, look, it's true. I mean, a mortgage basically, you know, especially a 30 year mortgage, you know, the bank is only going to do it if they think that they're going to give X amount of money. And over time, they're going to get X times two over the course of 30 years. I mean, that's why they have interest in doing this. Okay. But the society has interests, like America, as a value, wants to have homeowners. Home ownership was an American value to allow people to be settled, to purchase something, to have a settledness in terms of society. It, 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 it motivates, uh, you might say, good values of work and entrepreneurship and taking care of things, having a family. So we want to encourage all those things for society's function and might even say civilizing the function and calming the function, but also motivating the, the citizenry. Um, but also it's the main savings tool, I think to this day, for most Americans to buy a home is that that home, please God, it increases in value. So you buy it at X, it hopefully goes up multiples over the course of time, please God. And then by the end, when you've please God paid it off, you now own that home, but you also own its value. So you've been able to save all that money. So when you're giving the money to the bank, the truth is you're giving that money also to the principal. And that principal basically means every month is having, instead of having to buy it over 30 years or buy one lump sum, which you could, most Americans could never do, including us, you get 30 years to do it. And if you have a good relationship with your bank, which hopefully you'll accrue over time, and there's some challenges over this, hopefully, it's both yours and the bank's interest to help you with moments of challenge and what can be possible in the moments of that relationship because they want you to fulfill it as well. All right, so bottom line is I'm gonna teach you all mortgage class, but mortgages are actually, and there's also mortgage, there's like tax incentives to have a mortgage because the government wants you to have it. Now, I remember this specifically in my family. Both my parents, my grandparents were immigrants, um, came with very little money, grew up, you know, we would say lower class, lower working class in Brooklyn and Queens, New York. Um, you know, didn't, they had food on the table but really very little more than that. And when their children went to college, by the way, free college at Brooklyn Queens College in New York, it was a different time, and became public school teachers. I remember my parents went out to look for jobs in their lives. First of all, there were certain places they thought about maybe could we buy a house. First of all, at that time, there were places where Jews could not buy houses. It was limited. The government, or local governments, said that Jews are not allowed to buy these places here. It was known and when the realtor would take you around. Eventually went to Maryland, fast forward, and they bought their first house. They had their modest home. Uh, I feel very, very blessed for it. They bought that house. It was done because essentially it had this savings tool. And over the course of four or five years, they saved enough from that house's principal with its uh, valuation. They could buy a second home, slightly larger, which was the house home that I grew up in. Now, fast forward, they owned that house for 40 years. And I remember the day my parents sold that house. You know, they bought it for very, it was a beautiful but modest home in a modest part of my community, Columbia, Maryland, thank God. Um, that home, when it, it was four to five times, maybe five times in value by the time they totally sold it. And that nest egg of money was what provided my parents to this day, right now, a small nest egg that secures for them in their retirement. So I saw in my lifetime, my parents come from an immigrant background with nothing starting to be able to benefit of a mortgage that allowed them to make it really to the middle class because that mortgage in the end has provided them a safe retirement. There's also things being a public school teacher, but I'm gonna focus on this for a second. 
That is what the Torah is looking to do. This, that it should not be ideally that if a person follows the rules, does the right thing, that the underclass is permanent within the Solomon family. That the Solomons and others should have the opportunity through this savings tool to advance, to go beyond. If they follow the rules, if they follow properly, if they do what needs to be done, save, pay the bank. The bank is happy. They own this house. They've gotten paid interest over 30 years. My parents are happy. Now they have the value of this house. This is how Bahar is saying. It shouldn't be a permanent underclass. Now, there may be a new group that's immigrants, lower working class, that wants to get involved in that too. That's fine. But it shouldn't be that their children are destitute forever just because they're... And that's what it means for at least every seven years. It's to give opportunities in society for people to be released. But here's what I want to say. It then occurred to me when I was buying my first home and my parents were selling their home around the same time. Um, what happens when the government gives this savings tool to some, but doesn't give it to others like African-Americans? And when I realized that after, let's say the GI Bill, which was one of the first major opportunities, if you served the country, you were given this opportunity if you were white, but you weren't given this if you were of color. And then later on, people would be guided not to live in certain neighborhoods where housing values were on the rise, but parts of the city where housing values were not going, deemed to be likely to rise because they're in parts of the, for various reasons, were not in good parts of the city. And then not provided the best type of mortgage, all kinds of crazy mortgages or what about lending schemes that we're not giving home ownership, then you are creating a permanent underclass and not giving the same gift my parents were given to rise up as other Americans. I mean, it's not just discrimination and racism, which is true. It basically wants to create a permanent underclass of people of a specific race. So then we have to say is that the Torah is so adamantly against that. That if there are those people who refuse to try to rise up in society, to find freedom, to save up, you know, possibly, look, they may have made a choice on some level. But you give the opportunity to everyone to not be a permanent underclass. That's the seven-year freedom cycle. So let me wrap. When to this day, we wonder... Why is it that, you know, there's this intersection between class and race in our society? You say, why is it that it seems that there, you know, certain parts of certain cities, they they're, they're, you know, tend to be with minority or people of color or African American areas. They don't seem to, you know, of course, the entry, issue of gentrification comes up. I'm not going to move on past that for a second. Just, but why is it area exist? Well, there's a reason. People were directed to this part of the city, couldn't buy everywhere else. Were, a lot of not home ownership was mortgage opportunities weren't given just like they're given to every other white person. So it created this potential underclass, you know, and not given the gift of rising up, of the potential to rise up. The Taurus says, uh uh. That's not what we want from society. That's not what God wants from society. To have a class of people that will be the lower struggling. That may be part, but you must give them the opportunity to rise with fair rules, just like for everyone else. And when you haven't given that, then the society needs to take responsibility. People come to me and say, oh, you know, affirmative action, I don't agree. It's, it's not like you agree or disagree. There was a whole class of society, a race of society, that the government denied rights that others had. How are we supposed to deal with that? Just imagine, well, it went away. That's not how it goes away. There has to be governmental system, like in Bihar, every seven years, to cancel it. So I leave you with this. The Torah has a vision for society where there's not a permanent, specific underclass. There may be new people that come into that class, but not a permanent group that always is. We must provide opportunities for those debts to be canceled, for opportunities for growth, opportunities for wealth ac accumulation. That's what God is designing for our society. And when we go against that, we are not only sitting against God, we are actually also hurting ourselves because we all gain 
when every part of society, every part is given the opportunity to maximize their economic freedom. That's what we want to see. The economics lesson from the Torah. Bokertov and Lagba Omer Sameach.